Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this morning we're reading from Canton number 7, chapter number 2, entitled Hiranyakashipu, the King of Demons. Today we're reading from text number 58. Shri Hiranyakashipu Ruvacha Bala Evam Pravadati Sarve Vishmita Chaitasha Gyatayo menire sarvam Anityam ayatotitam Shri Hiranyakashipuru vacha Bala evam pravadati Sarve vishmita chaitasha Gyatayo menire sarvam Anityam Mayatotitam Shri Hiranyaka Shipuru Vacha Bala Evam Pravadati Sarve Vishmita Chetasha Gyatayo Menire Sarvam Anityam Mayatotitam Pravadati Sarve Pravadati Yatayo merire sarvam Anityam mayatotitam Shri Ranyakashipu uvacha Palamevam pravadati Shri Hiranyakashipuru Vacha Bala Evam Pravadati Sarve Vishmita Chetasha Gyatayo Menire Sarvam Anityam Mayatotitam Nagashipu Vacha Balameva Pravadati Vishmita Chetasha Gyata Yo Menire Sarvam Ayyam Mayatotitam Shri Hiranyakashipu Vacha 
Sri Hiranyakashipu said, Bale Wow Yamaraj in the form of a boy. Evam Das Pravadati was speaking very philosophically. Sarve all Vishmita struck with wonder. Chaitasha their hearts. Gyataya the relatives. Menire they thought. Sarvam everything material. Anityam temporary. Ayata utitam arisen from temporary phenomena. Translation and purple by His Divine Grace, Shila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Shila Prabhupada Ki. Just before I do the translation, this is a very interesting section of the Srimad Bhagavatam. As we know, the Bhagavatam is a set of conversations. The conversation that we are essentially reading in Srimad Bhagavatam is the conversation between Sutta Goswami and the sages of Naimisharanya headed by Shonaka Rishi. However, in the course of that conversation, they quote many, many other conversations. And this part of the Bhagavatam is the part of the Bhagavatam where we go to the deepest level of conversation. So this is actually a conversation six levels in. The first conversation is between Sutta and the sages. They are quoting the conversation between Sukadev and Parikshit. They are quoting the conversation between Yudhisthir and Narada. They are quoting the conversation between Hiranyakashipu and the relatives. They are now co quoting the conversation between Yamaraj and the wives of Suyagya. And they will now quote the conversation between the two Kulinga birds. So what you are reading is a conversation, inside a conversation, inside a conversation, inside a conversation, inside a conversation, which is inside a conversation. Hare Krishna. You got that, right? <laughs> Translation. Hiranyakashipu said, while Yamaraj in the form of a small boy was instructing all the relatives surrounding the dead body of Suyagya. Everyone was struck with wonder by his philosophical words. They could not understand that everything material is temporary, not continuing to exist. Purport. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 2.18. Antavanta ime deha Nitya Shokta Sharirina. The body is perishable, but the soul within the body is imperishable. Therefore, the duty of those advanced in knowledge in human society is to study the constitutional position of the imperishable soul and not waste the valuable v time of human life in merely maintaining the body and not considering life's real responsibility. Every human being should try to understand how the spirit soul can be happy and where he can attain an eternal blissful life of knowledge. Human beings are meant to study these subject matters, not to be absorbed in caring for the temporary body, which is sure to change. No one knows whether he will receive a human body again. There is no guarantee for according to one's work, one may get any body from that of a demigod to that of a dog. In this regard, Srila Madhvacharya comments, Aham mama bimanadi tvayotattam anityakam maha dadi yathotam cha nitya chapi yathotita ashvatantreva prakriti Svatantro nitya evacha yathartha bhutas chapara eka eva janardana. Only Janardan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is ever existing, but his creation, the material world, is temporary. 
Therefore, everyone who is captivated by the material energy and absorbed in thinking, I am this body, and everything belonging to this body is mine, is in illusion. One should think only of being eternally a part of Janardhan, and one's endeavor in this material world, especially in this human form of life, should be to attain the association of Janardhan by going back home, back to Godhead. Srila mm -hmm. Prabhupada Ki. So yes, everyone will die. That's a fact. There was one uh, Eastern European philosopher, Leo Tolstoy. He said, I know that everyone has to die, but I thought an exception would be made in my case. There's no exception. Life is like a game of chess. Whether you're the king, the queen, or the pawn, at the end of the game, everyone ends up in the box. Everyone finishes. Therefore, Yamaraj asks you this dear, what is the most amazing thing in the world? Ahani ahani bhutani gachanti ha yamalayam sheshastavaramichanti kimascharyam mataparam What is the most amazing thing in the world? Ahani ahani bhutani every single day living entities Gachan Diha Yamalayam are going to the abode of Yamaraj. Every single day, living entities are dying. Shesha Stavaramichandi, but I think I will stay here forever. Kimascharyam Ataparam. What can be more amazing than this? It's amazing how every single day we see death, but death always amazes us, isn't it? When we hear, oh, someone has died, immediately the heart feels, oh, shock. Although we know death is there, death is coming, death is just waiting to happen. And so, anityam uh, asukam lokam, Krishna says, this world is temporary. Everything in this world is temporary. Uh, not just the body, but even everything we get on the journey through this life in this body, all of that is also temporary. Once there was a king and he had uh, imprisoned many, many subjects. So one day he came to the subjects and he said, if you can answer my question and give me something, then I will let you free. And he said, I want you to give me something that will make me happy when I'm sad and sad when I'm happy. If you can give me something that will make me happy when I'm sad and which the same thing will make me sad when I'm happy, if you can solve my question, then I let you free from prison. So everyone was going around, around, around. Sometimes I ask audience this question. One time, one Grihasta man put his hand up and he said, marriage. <laughs> I said, you said it, not me. <laughs> so, one person came to the king and he said, I got the answer. So the king said, this better be good. He said, I got the answer. And he put a box in front of him. The king said, what's the meaning of this box? He said, no, no, open the box. So he opened the box and there was a ring. So the king said, how will this make me happy when I'm sad and sad when I'm happy? He said, I want you to put this ring on your finger. So the king put the ring on his finger and he said, now I want you to read what it says on the ring. And what did it say on the ring? This too shall pass. This will pass. When you're happy, don't worry. It's coming to an end soon. And when you're sad, don't worry. It's coming to an end soon. Sitoshna sukaduka da agama paino nityas. It's all a nitya. It's all temporary appearance and disappearance. Because everything in the world just comes and goes. In time, we lose everything. You lose your abilities. We become very proud of our abilities. 
I'm good at this, I'm good at that, I'm able at this, I'm able at that. And then eventually in the course of time, all your abilities are taken away. Krishna takes it all away. We become proud of our facilities. I have this, I have that. Money, possessions, power. With time, every, everything lose, you lose everything. It's all taken away. We become proud of our identities. I'm in this position. I'm this kind of person. With time, you lose all of your titles as well. Everything is taken away. Therefore, mrityu sarva harascaham. In the form of death, Krishna comes and takes away everything. And during life, Krishna periodically takes things away from us. So time is a very, very amazing force of nature because time is removing all of our illusion because we illusorily identify with so many things and so what the force of time does Carlos me Krishna says time I am and I come and I take away everything to help you realize you're not your abilities you're not your facilities you're not defined by your relationships of this world. You're not defined by your um, titles or your positions. None of this is you. You are an eternal soul, separate from all of these things. And so, everyone will have everything taken away from them. And then the final journey is that even your own body is taken away. In the Bhagavad Gita... When Krishna shows Arjun the universal form, then Arjun sees everyone entering into the body of the universal form, dying. And there, two analogies are given. Krishna says, uh, or is described, the universal form is described, that everyone is entering into the universal form like moths into the fire. That's one example that's given. And the other example is given is that everyone is entering into the universal form and dying like rivers entering into a ocean. So Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, he says that these are the two different modes of dying. Some people, everyone will have to die. But some people die like moths going into a fire. The example is Duryodhan. And some are entering death like rivers into the ocean and the example is Bhishma Dev. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says. So he says some people, their life is like a river entering into an ocean. Before they enter into the ocean, that river gives so much nourishment, gives so much pleasure, gives so much service to society and then finally that river enters into the ocean. So the great devotees like Bhishma Dev, they give so much and then they die. Whereas Duryodhan, the moth, is so self-absorbed that on the way to death, they don't think about anyone or anything, they just want to reach their goal. And ultimately they die without doing anything good in this world. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says, we have the opportunity to die in one of these two ways. If you die like the moth going into the fire, like Duryodhan, then when you reach your destination, you feel like everything has burned to ashes. And you feel your whole life has disappeared before you. But if you enter into the ocean and you die in that way, then what happens is when it comes to the point of death, you just rest peacefully in that body of water with no anxiety and no distress. So like this, there are different ways also of dying. But what here is being explained by Hiranyakashipu to his relatives is that Hiranyakashipu is saying you have to become detached because ultimately everything will be taken away. 
So there's different ways to become detached. One is that we go through all the experiences of life. Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha. Eventually in Vanaprastha we begin to give everything up. And then we prepare for death. So that's one way in which we prepare for death. By gradually going into the world, experiencing and then gradually giving everything up so that we have no attachment. And the other way to uh, pursue uh, the ultimate goal of life is to simply, from the beginning, embrace detachment and renunciation and do that for your whole life. Of course, when Narad Muni taught the sons of Daksha to do this way, option B, then Daksha was not very happy. Because his 10,000 sons, the Hariyashvas, Hariyashvas, right? Hariyashvas, yes. He was expecting them to enter into family life. And Narad Muni says, you don't have to. Uh, you can just go direct renunciation. And then later on, Daksha, he criticized Narad Muni. He said, you have done a great injustice because you have taught them about detachment before they've enjoyed this world. First they should enjoy this world and then they can become detached. And Narad Muni explained to him that different people learn in different ways. Some people have to experience, but some people simply by hearing can understand there's no point trying to enjoy this world. Let me just leave it all behind. So one way or the other, direct or indirect, immediate or step by step, everyone has to come to the point of detachment. When Parikshit got cursed to die in seven days, then the Bhagavatam explains, Atma Jaya Sutagara Pashudra Vinabandushu Rajecha Vikale Nityam Virudham Mamatam Jaho Parikshit realized, I'm going to die in seven days, therefore let me start giving everything up. What's the first thing he gave up? Atma, attachment to his own body. Jaya, attachment to his wife, he left it behind. Suta, attachment to the children, left it behind. Gada, attachment to his palaces, left it behind. Pashu, Attachment to his uh, animals left it behind. Dravina, attachment to his treasury left it behind. Rajay, attachment to his kingdom left it behind. Because he knew if I don't voluntarily leave these things behind, anyway in seven days I'm going to be stripped of all of these things. Therefore, do you want it to be snatched from your hand? Or do you want to just give it up and walk away? Therefore, he was intelligent. He understood that I have to give everything up. So, in Krishna consciousness, detachment is not the goal. Detachment is not even an anga of bhakti. However, detachment is an important principle which can help one to nourish their bhakti. Because while one is holding on to material things, material aspirations, material ideas, Krishna says, Bhogeshwarya prashaktanam tayaparit chetasham vyavasayatmika buddhi samadho nuvidhiyate. If you're still holding on here, then you won't be able to give the full focus, the full attention, the full. Uh, one-pointed, resolute determination for devotional service. Therefore, internally, every single devotee has to be becoming more and more detached from the material world so that they can become more and more attached to Krishna. So Hiranyakashipu here is uh, telling his relatives so many nice points. Unfortunately, he hasn't understood any of it himself. Sometimes we can be very good at teaching philosophy, but how much have we actually understood that philosophy? 
Therefore, knowledge has to be accompanied by many things. Otherwise, that knowledge doesn't go very, very deep. So if you look very, very closely at our Shastra and our different accounts, then you will see that knowledge has to be accompanied by different things. The first thing knowledge has to be accompanied by is Sangha. Unless one learns knowledge in the association of devotees, that knowledge won't actually go deep into one's heart. Tapan Mishra was someone who had studied many, many literatures, but he didn't have Vaishnav Sangha. And therefore, what did he say? Bahu Shastra, Bahu Vakya, Chite Brahma Hoi, Sadhya Sadhana Shreshta, Na Hoi Nishchoi. He said, I've studied so many books, Bahu Shastra, Bahu Vakya, I've heard so many things, Chitte Brahma Hoi, but I'm still confused. I have no idea what I'm meant to be doing. Because one must understand Shastra, Satam Prasangan, Mama Virya Samvido. One must hear Shastra in the association. So, therefore, knowledge must be accompanied by Sangha. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, knowledge must be accompanied by faith. Shraddha vallabhate jnanam tatpara shamyatendriya Krishna says, Shraddha vallabhate jnanam One who is faithful, labhate jnanam, they can actually get knowledge. It's not just a matter of hearing, but one must hear with faith. Otherwise, without that faith, the heart is not a fertile place for that knowledge to take place so knowledge must be accompanied by faith knowledge must also be accompanied by humility Krishna explains in the Gita amanitvam adambitvam unless one is humble one cannot receive any knowledge and through one's knowledge if one doesn't become humble then one can understand that person didn't realize anything at all. Therefore, when Romaharshan Sutta was in the forest of Naimisharanya and he was speaking on Bhagavatam, and Balaram came, and Romaharshan Sutta failed to show proper respect to Balaram, then Balaram blasted him. Rishir Bhagavato Bhutva Shishuddhitya Bahunicha Setihasa Puranani Dharma Shastrani Sarvasha Adantasya Vinitasya Vrita Pandita Manina Nagunaya Bhavantisma Natasyeva Jitatmana Rishir Bhagavato Bhutva, you are the disciple of Vyas. Uh, Setihasa Puranani, you have studied the Itihas, you have studied the Puranas. Dharma Shastrani Sarvasha, you studied the Dharma Shastra, you've practically studied all of the books that there are. Adantasya, Vinitasya, but you never became humble. There's no humility in your heart. Vrita, Pandita, Manina, but you think that you're a big scholar. Na Gunaya, Bhavanti, Sma, no good qualities came from all of your studies. Natasyeva jitatmana, and therefore all of your study of Shastra is simply like an actor acting in a play. Heavy. Knowledge must be accompanied by humility, otherwise, what's the value of that knowledge? So, like this, as we go further and further, we will see that knowledge must be accompanied by other things. Knowledge must be accompanied by seva. Tadvidi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. If you want to really have knowledge, then you don't just study books, but what you do is you go out in the world and you serve. Because it's through that service. Sevan mukhe hijivado. Svayam eva spuratyada. 
this was one of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's most quoted verses that one must serve and then the senses become purified and then one can understand Krishna. So all of these things are there. Uh, knowledge must be accompanied by all of these different things. Knowledge must ultimately be accompanied by mercy. If one doesn't please the Vaishnavas, and if one doesn't get mercy, then that knowledge won't go anywhere. Brahmaji understood this. And therefore, what did he say? Athapite deva padam bujadvaya prashada lesa nugrihita evahi janati tattvam bhagavan mahimno nachanya meko pichiran vichinvan prashada lesa nugrihita evahi one can know so many things, but if they don't have a slight trace of the mercy of the Lord, Janati Tattvam Bhagavan Mahim, no, they cannot understand the glories of the Supreme Lord. Brahmaji had he, he was bewildered. So he came to this realization, you need mercy. So therefore, here we see in the Bhagavatam, Hiranyakashipu Uvacha. So many things to say, but how much has he understood it? Because there's no Sangha, there's no Seva, there's no Sadachar, there's no mercy, um, there's no faith. And therefore the knowledge doesn't go very, very deep. And so the Bhagavatam is not just meant to make us into scholars. The Bhagavatam is meant to make us into bhaktas. You graduate from the university of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when you become a beggar. A scholar has to become a beggar. The proof is Sarvabhom Bhattacharya. He was a scholar, but then later on he became a beggar because he realized more advanced than a scholar is a beggar because a beggar is one who has understood the real Bhavartha the real meaning, the real purple of the knowledge, because they haven't just understood philosophically, but they've understood which is a heart, with a heart which is full of devotion. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. So I stop here. I won't speak too long. Uh, yes, if there are any questions or comments or corrections. Yes, ma'am. Over here. Over here. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, very grateful for your deep enlightenment, which I opened my eyes to become beggar instead of scholar. So thank you so much for Hare telling Krishna. me the goal. So I beg you one thing <laughs> immediately <laughs> to please enlighten me. What is this quality of humility? Because it seems to be very profound thing. And many people are very, you know, submissive, sweet-spoken and, uh, you know, humble, and, uh, not humble, humble, I don't know, I am trying to understand. What is humility? Yeah, that's what, can you please help me understand? I think that takes one lifetime to understand. <laughs> His Grace Burijan Prabhu, once he was in Vrindavan, and you know in Vrindavan you have the sugarcane machine? You know, that big wheel, and then the stick goes through and it crushes the, wheel, uh, the stick. And then, so he saw that sugar cane machine and he made a prayer. May the hard, crushing wheel of life extract some humility from my offense hardened heart, and may the nectar of that humility give rise to pure love for Krishna. Okay. 
May the hard crushing wheel of life extract some humility from my offense hardened heart. The heart has become so hard over lifetimes. Tadasmasadam ridayam batedam na griyamaner hari nama dhyayai. The heart has become so hard, so impersonal, so miserly, so insensitive. And we need to break that heart. We need to uh, soften that heart. Humility means a soft heart. Humility means to understand I'm not the center of existence. Humility means to be joyfully insignificant. Humility means to have no expectation. And our Varshana Swami in New Vrindavan says, humility doesn't mean to think less of yourself, but it means to think of yourself less. And one devotee said something to me about humility, which I liked very much. He said, if you're not perfect, then you should be humble. But the moment you're humble, you're perfect. <laughs> That's very nice. When we look in the mirror this morning, we are remembering bhakti nahi, bedi nahi. Prabhupada's humility is our reality. We look in the mirror and we say bhakti nahi. I present myself as such a devotional soul. But if I look in my heart, how much devotion do I have? I present myself as a scholar. I sit on a seat and quote many verses. But if I look in my heart, how much of that knowledge have I understood? Bedi nahi. But still, in all of that, if we can humbly take the humble position and rely on the holy name of Krishna, then there's still a hope. Therefore, one should become humble and rely on the holy name of Krishna. Mahaprabhu says, Urdhva bahu kahi koha suna sarva lok. Nama Sutre Ganti Pare Kanta E Shlok. This uh, verse, Tranada P. Sunichena, you should string it on the thread of the holy name and wear it around your neck every single day. That's the only hope. There's no hope in this world unless one becomes a humble servant of the holy name. So, yeah, this is humility. So. It's a very deep topic. These are some thoughts. Hare Krishna. I see hands. I don't. Someone can choose. I don't know. Is it on? Yes, it's yeah. on. Thank you very much for your wonderful class. Uh, I'm fortunate to have your association for the second time in a very short period of time. Um, I was in at Intel in Phoenix, Arizona, oh, okay. where I got an opportunity to hear your seminar. And coincidentally, I had come to Pune today, and I was not expecting you, but uh, so grateful to okay. get a chance to hear you. from you so soon. Um, Maharaj, one question was that uh, if the if this material world had not progressed after Brahmaji originally created it, um, still this bhakti process would have still been applicable, meaning chanting, eating prasad, taking association, you know, all those processes, still uh, all the conditioned souls would have been able to practice it and go back home to Godhead. But then so much of material progress has taken place ever since. And today we are sp spending so much material energies into creating iPhones or Teslas or self-driving cars and uh, grahasthas, you know, they are working for such companies or Microsoft and Google or aspiring to work in such companies. So, or Intel. <laughs> <laughs> or Intel, exactly. Or Intel. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so uh, as grahasthas, how do we um, understand or how do we feel enthused to spend so much of energies, uh, hours and hours, into creating such technologies which is really not needed. We say we use it just because it is Krishna's energy and it's in Krishna's service, but is it really required at first place? And then for our next generation, do we encourage them to become computer science engineers and go and work for such companies? I mean, spend so much of hours and get into the competition for at first place 
to end up struggling doing your regular bhakti practices rupa goswami says anashaktasya vishayan yatharham upayunjata nirbanda krishna sambande yuktam vairagyam uchyate basically we have to make the best use of a bad bargain we're living in the material world that's bad news bad news but we have to make the best use of a bad bargain here we are now what we have to do is we have to learn the hari sambandha the hari sambandha means how do you connect everything you have in service to krishna one time a reporter said to prabhupad why are you traveling on planes all around the world prabhupad said you are going to hell the speed of a plane and if i follow you in a bullet car i can't catch you <laughs> so therefore we use everything social media facebook instagram tiktok twitter like love follow do whatever you need to do <laughs> we are trying to spread the word and we'll use whatever we can So if we can use technology if we can use whatever is here in the world and purify it once a reporter said to prabhupad also why are you using all of these vehicles prabhupad said we are the only qualified ones who should be allowed to use these things <laughs> because we're using it for the right purpose actually all of you shouldn't be using it we should be using it so we use everything so we just we are here in the world what are we going to do even if you say as grihastha should we be going in and working for firms and living in the city but how many of us could just eject ourselves from the world okay here you go eject yourself from the world go and live in a farm can we do it maybe we can't because we are conditioned so then we live in the city because also we're conditioned but then what we try to do is we make it krishna conscious so like that yes the world is unnecessarily complicated and uh is advancement but there's no advancement this is not advancement they say first we were nowhere and then we progressed and we got somewhere then we got technology and now we're everywhere but because we have technology we're always constantly elsewhere <laughs> and because we're constantly elsewhere practically we're nowhere <laughs> so it's just it's all going around in circles the material world is just going around in circles is is absolutely crazy we think we do things we think is normal but is absolutely like say for example 50 years ago when you wanted to get from one place to another you rode a bicycle yeah you ride a bicycle you go to the other place then what happened is we became advanced so we built motorcycles so now the whole day we speed around in motorcycles in cars going from place to place to place and then what they do in cities like london is after working hard all day they go to the gym and then they go in a room and they sit on a bicycle and they ride it and they sweat and sweat and sweat and they go absolutely nowhere <laughs> and we think this is normal this is like this is very advanced gym membership this world is mad <laughs> there's no doubt about it is completely mad but we just make the best use of a bad bargain and then we get out i think some matajis had questions also sir Hare Krishna Maharaj thank you so much for this eye opening class and I'm eternally indebted to you even the yesterday class on leadership that you gave was so wonderful especially for me it was an eye opening class 
Maharaj, you mentioned that knowledge has to be backed up by association, detachment, seva. And it's been years we have, you know, been gaining knowledge from Srila Prabhupada's books, but it's very difficult that knowledge application, we've been trying, 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 and it's a little difficult. I mean, if I see for myself, uh, I need to do a lot of changes. At least I'm aware that I have to do a lot of changes. But many times it is very difficult to apply that knowledge at the right moment, at the right place, to the right person. So if you can help me, you can enlighten me on that. Keep trying. <laughs> 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 Mataji, there's no special magic formula. We just have to keep going and we have to keep being eager and we have to keep looking at ourselves in the mirror every single day and saying, I'm not there, but today I can be better. You see, generally we are not changing in a flash. In the Shastra we find all of these uh, accounts where individuals just have this immediate change. We, we were thinking it would be like that. The day we came to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. It's never going to be the same again. But then we go back into our old habits again. So, step by step, bit by bit, um, we are going and we're trying to improve. Um, so yesterday I was mentioning in the Brahmachari class that we have to become very, very thoughtful. We have to observe our inner world. I was encouraging all the devotees that if we can all journal and write our thoughts, our hopes, our successes, our failures, our observations of ourselves, how we can improve, then if we become very, very thoughtful, then what will happen is the quality of our inner life and our inner devotion to Krishna will become refined over time. So yes, there is a gap, and, um, but it's okay. You are a different person. You are not who you were five years ago. You're not who you were 10 years ago. You've changed. Yes, I have so much more to change, but you've already changed. That means the process works. Therefore, you have to keep walking. So they say if you're walking through chaos, just keep walking. So we're walking through this world and it's a little bit chaotic and we keep walking, keep going forward. It's okay. I could go in more detail, but I think this is the essence of... Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for always enlightening us with your profound knowledge. I'm very much indebted to you. Um, Maharaj, I have one question since long time. How to maintain balance between self-respect, humility, and tolerance? You see, humility is based not on self-deprecating ourself. Humility is based on seeing the greatness of Krishna. A devotee, as they get closer and closer to Krishna, they begin to feel themselves smaller and smaller. But it's joyful insignificance because it's in relation to the greatness of Krishna. That's how you can be humble and at the same time have self-respect because you understand, I'm not nothing, anything great, but I have the opportunity to serve Krishna. And therefore, a devotee is simultaneously humble and at the same time has self-respect. They understand that I, like one devotee came to Prabhupada and said, I'm the most fallen. Prabhupada said, you're the most nothing. You can do something. So you can do something for Krishna. And therefore, the self has some value. And whatever we can do for Krishna, Krishna accepts it. Therefore, 
So like this, we are, we are fallen, but we are very, very hopeful. That's why Krishna Das Kaviraj can, Goswami can say, I'm lower than the worm in the stool. I'm more sinful than Jagai and Madai. Anyone who sees me loses their pious act credits. And then in the ne very next verse, he says, but I got the mercy of Nityananda. And therefore, I'm very, very hopeful. So a devotee is fallen, but hopeful. And in that way, humble, but at the same time, has some value for themselves. And tolerance means yes. Externally, we may have to address things. Externally, if someone does something wrong, we may have to point it out. Externally, if there is a difficult situation, we may have to act to change it. But internally, one should be tolerant. Internally, one should realize this is the world is made like this. The world is meant to be like this. The world is perfectly imperfect. When I see the imperfection of the world, I should be joyful. This is perfect. Because we need to get out. And therefore, Krishna needs to uh, give us a helping hand. So, like this. So these are some thoughts. I hope this helps in some way. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj, for your enlightening talk. I have been following your channel, Wisdom That Breathe, and I have listened to many, many, many lectures of yours, and you've been always enlightening me. And uh, one thing, I, I can tell you one incident that one day I was seriously contemplating on uh, stopping this devotional service because I was thinking that I was not getting any test for it, and that day I listened to one class of yours where you said that stopping now is like coming to the finish line and then going back. And that was really a turning point for me. So thank you so much for everything. And I have one question that uh, how do women approach Vanaprastha? How should we prepare for Vanaprastha? And how does it look like in this current age? Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Yes, Vanaprastha is definitely the finishing line. <laughs> You're there. Actually, I feel that Vanaprastha ashram is the most joyful ashram. Brahmacharis, when we are brahmacharis in our early life, we still have a whole life ahead of us. So many decisions, so many complexities. It's a stressful ashram as well, sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Grihastha ashram, I don't know, you can say better than me. <laughs> but uh, it's also a stressful ashram. You know, so many responsibilities, so many. Sanyas ashram, wow. <laughs> also a little stressful, a lot of traveling, moving, uh, management. Nice, can serve, but. Vanaprastha, very nice ashram. It's almost in like in the middle of everything. Get the best of everything. So actually, Vanaprastha ashram is a very beautiful ashram because you've lived out your life, desires have been fulfilled, kids have grown up, you have time, you have space, you still have good health. You can do so many things for Krishna. So what does Vanaprastha Ashram look like for, um, uh, for you? Um, do more service. Now you can live around. Look, just see this beautiful temple. It's just such a center of devotional service. Morning to evening, you can come here. You can make garlands. You can teach. You can uh, do so many things. So number one, do more service. Number two, spend time in the Holy Dham. See, what we have to do before we leave this world is you have to lose your heart in Vrindavan. And therefore, if you lose your heart in Vrindavan, then uh, then your life is perfect. So spend time in the Holy Dham. You can go. You're in India. You're so close. You can go anytime you want. Study Shastra. Chant the holy name of Krishna. Yes, what about one day 
a week if you just go away and chant 64 rounds? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we will enter into a different relationship with the holy name. You have all the time, you have all the opportunity. How many lifetimes did it take to get to this point? So, you're at the finish line. Don't give up. No? Okay. <clears throat> so I just speak one thing and then be. Okay, what I'll do, let me just take the final questions and then I'll do that last thing. Is that okay? Yeah? Well, but actually, Prabhu, when shall we stop? Because I'm over time, no? Okay, this is last question and then I'll just say something and then. So, okay. uh, thank you, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. I had a question about this technology thing. So. Yes. Theoretically, I understand. I'm trying to implement it in my life. But for the younger generation, how do we um, represent and convince or, you know, the way that, you know, they don't get too much into it because nowadays it's too much for them. Everything is phone. Everything is Instagram. Their life is all that. Yes. See, how much are you going to be able to stop your children from being on their devices? You can. You can tell them certain hours of the day, don't use it. You can create some boundaries that may help. The reality of this world is that it's moving in a certain direction. I don't know how much you're going to be able to stop it. But what you can begin to do is give them a higher taste. I think in this age, there's no other way. <laughs> you need to give them a higher taste. If they uh, appreciate hearing, chanting, if they appreciate simplicity, if they like to do Krishna conscious activities, then naturally that will um, take them away from wasting their brain cells on all these things. So sometimes I feel what we're trying to do in the world is we're trying to fight a battle that you're not going to be able to win. Therefore, instead of trying to stop them from something, we have to try to give them something better. And, uh, and therefore, uh, maybe create some boundaries in how they use technology but then overall just try to give them uh, entrance into a better life, a more fulfilling life. Um, appreciate nature, isn't it? Now it's like kids don't go out and play in the park anymore. They play on a football ground in the screen. So let them appreciate nature, go take them to places where they connect like that so anyway so much more can be said on this but. okay so i'll just finish up here because uh, so one final thing we want to share with everyone as you know Srila Prabhupada gifted us um, many many things uh, Srila Prabhupada was an ambassador of the spiritual world and so Srila Prabhupada brought the wealth of the spiritual world down here into this material manifestation. And one of the greatest treasure houses that Srila Prabhupada brought to this world uh, was the Srimad Bhagavatam. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. So the Bhagavatam is very, very significant in our life. Actually, what we're all trying to do in our life is to make the Bhagavatam our best friend. Sanatan Goswami says this. Madeka bandhu mat sangin mad guru man mahadhana man nishtaraka mad bhagya madananda namo stute. He looks at Srimad Bhagavatam and he says, Srimad Bhagavatam, Madeka bandhu, you are my best friend. Mat sangin, you are my constant companion. 
Madguro, you're my spiritual teacher. Man Mahadhana, you're my greatest wealth. Man Nishtaraka, Srimad Bhagavatam, you are lifting me up. Mad Bhagya, Srimad Bhagavatam, you're the best thing that happened to me in my life. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances to you. So if one develops a very, very close relationship with Srimad Bhagavatam, then uh, their life becomes glorious. So what we do in the ISKCON world is we try to give everyone an opportunity to establish their relationship with Srimad Bhagavatam. So as you know now, in this time of the year, the um, month of Bhadra is beginning. And in this month, uh, the devotees are distributing uh, Srimad Bhagavatam sets to everyone and anyone to give them the opportunity to connect. So I think Pune has a... Uh, now you are the top in India, no? Book distribution, is it? Oh, you've divided. So you're not the top anymore. Okay, because I heard Pune was on the top now. You had also beaten Delhi. Anyway, there it's there. So you, uh, so yes, we are trying to distribute thousands and thousands of Bhagavatam sets. Um, so yes, uh, Prabhuji, is there any specific announcement or you want me to make? Sarvalakshan Prabhu. Sarvalakshan Prabhu? Yeah. Prabhu will tell us how we can all uh, get involved. If anyone wants to uh, purchase a Bhagavatam set today, I am also selling Bhagavatam sets. 